On today's episode of The Intangibles, we'll be kicking things off as always with the play of the game. At 10 minutes and 58 seconds, we'll level up your game with VOD reviews. And finally, at 30 minutes and 47 seconds, we'll break down Sonic Mania. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, this is another episode of The Intangibles. I am one of your hosts, Matt, uh, joined by my wonderful friend, brother, colleague, uh, and gamer, Kenny. Hello. Uh, yes, this week- all those things I am. <laughs> and that's that's it. You're limited to those things, nothing else. I mean, it's four titles. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> Um, we're excited to bring you another episode uh, where we're going to talk about some some different things um, related to gaming. I mean, how, how how much better can you say it, right? I like I like the idea of today we'll be talking about different things. We're gonna be we talking about some time. stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, but everything's gonna be game related, uh, and I think this week it's pretty much all video game related, unless you have a play of the game that's outside of video games, which would be very interesting to see. Well, I guess we'll have to find out, won't we? (laughs) So without further ado, I guess we should start with segment number one, the play of the game. Um, So in this segment, we both, you know, essentially want to talk about who or what we think deserves the play of the game this week. And it needs to be... You know, it needs to be with our theme of being intangible, right? It needs to be representative of those who aren't represented on the scoreboard at the end of a victory. So uh, I'll turn it over to you to start. Hmm. That's a great intro. I feel like I, I failed the, the mission here as far as it shouldn't be tangible. <laughs> so, so here's, I'll give you the pitch of what I should say based on the intangibles. I should say play of the game goes to me this week. Uh, because I had a game of League of Legends that I played with our mutual friend Troy. I was playing in the mid lane. I no 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 excuse me. I was playing support. This is how big of a role I played. I could not even tell you what role <laughs> I was in the game. I think I was bot lane support. I was playing as Morgana, who is like a enchantress. She binds people. She immobilizes people. She puts spell shields on people. Uh, she locks people up. That's her whole deal. I played like absolute trash the entire game. My final score was like two kills and ten deaths and some number of assists. <laughs> um, but we stuck it through. I say we stuck it through. Really, Troy stuck it through. He played in the jungle. So he's roaming around looking to make plays happen across the map. And boy, did he. He finished the game with a score that was something like 12 0 and 15 so 12 kills no deaths 15 assists and the way that his champ worked he was playing cho'gath which is like a void monster and its whole mechanic is he walks around and eats things and gets bigger the more he eats so he eats minions he eats champions he eats neutral objectives he eats it all he grows from cho'gath to to giant graph to massive erection graph. I, I thought you said chode to start with so i mean he does start as a chode like he starts <laughs> as like he is smaller we were laughing about it the other day because his character model starts so small that he's shorter than some of the more diminutive characters in the game but he literally gets he gets as big as the towers like when you get him to maximum size jesus christ they, yeah they put a cap on it you can only get up to 10. You can go, you can stack infinitely. You can eat as many things as you want, and your health pool keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger the more you eat. But your size gets capped. So once you get 10 stacks, it stops scaling you up. But you can build an item that scales up your size. <laughs> uh, it actually scales it up based on how many items you build. So there's a cap to that. And then you can buy a potion called Elixir of Iron that also gives you bonus size. So all that together, he is as big as the entire lane, which Good is a pretty God. amazing thing. Uh, Troy, at the end of this game, had t- like 20 stacks on Cho'Gath, which is not an exaggeration. I think the most I've ever seen in a game that was not a joke. <laughs> like I've seen I've seen people go into like the practice mode and just fool around and see how big can I get this character. But this sure. is an actual ranked game that we played from beginning to end, and he had 20 
stacks. Now, I said I was gonna give it to me for sticking it through. I am gonna give it to Troy. The reason I wanna give it to him is one thing that he tends to do is in a game where he's doing really well, he'll have something tucked under his hat and not share it until the end of the game. And at the end of the game, he shared with me, he didn't miss a feast. That's his ultimate that eats something and makes him bigger. He hit all of them the entire game. He always killed something with it, which is wow. pretty incredible, which makes sense. It's why his stacks are so big. Sure. So play of the game to Troy for landing every single fee stack and growing to enormous size. Just securing every kill on his ultimate. Yeah, that's pretty fantastic. And hard carrying. Like our entire team, like I did bad, but our whole team was just awful. And he just <laughs> refused to lose that game. It was amazing. It just goes to show you, all you people out there who play team-based games, don't give up. You know, like we, we've all been there where it sucks and you're just getting your ass beat. But those games where you end up turning it around and you win it, oh, they feel so good, you know? He, even if you weren't necessarily the one to turn it around, but you were part of it, ooh, it's just, it feels fantastic. That will probably be an entire category, an entire subject of an episode someday of not giving up. But yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, not giving up tied in with rage quitters and toxicity and all sorts we'll, of good stuff. We'll get there one day. <laughs> how, about, how about you? What was your play of the game? I thought long and hard about this, and I have a good one for Overwatch that I'm going to save for a future episode. Um, Interesting. But I want I want that in, in your head. You know, I, I want you to be thinking about that. So okay. rather than going Overwatch this week, I wanted what to go with a different. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to go with a different game that uh, Veronica, my lovely wife, and I have been playing, uh, and it's a game that you and I are hoping to play together at some point as well. Cuphead. Uh, so if anybody's not familiar with Cuphead, it is a platformer. Uh, essentially, it's a bunch of boss battles and run and gun levels um, where you and you can play by yourself or you can play co-op uh, with a second person. You're both on screen just shooting everywhere, trying to take out these bosses and bad guys and navigate these levels. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most important uh, mechanics of the game in co-op is that there's this parry mechanic that it builds up your super meter but you can also when your teammate dies a little pink heart shows up in their ghost as it kind of slithers away up the screen if you parry on that heart they come back to life with one hit point and they can keep fighting so there's been you can do two that you can do that infinitely basically you can always yep. res your teammate exactly as soon as you both die at the same time game is over done for right. and, you, and you have a limited amount of time when it's on screen to do that so um it sounds like it's like busted but it's actually especially when you get in these boss fights with just shit flying all over the screen it, it becomes very difficult but i'm gonna give my play of the game to veronica this week because there have been at least two that i can think of off the top of my head boss fights that we've done where in the last phase of the boss, you know, the worst phase of it, she has parried me every time I died to the point that I was the last person standing, she's dead, and I put the final blow on the bosses. So without Veronica, would not be able to be there, we wouldn't have been able to beat them. Uh, she kept me in the fight, and so this week my play of the game goes to her. That's awesome. That's so cinematic, too. It's, I honestly, the game has been a ton of fun and so challenging like even more so i knew it was a hard game but it's even more so when you get into it um ton of fun though well i'm excited to try i've watched a ton of it obviously and i know a lot about the game but i've never played the game yeah i'm sure that'll, that'll be, fun be to jump episode into. in the future too damn look at all these fucking previews we're just doling out right now <laughs> building it up well normally now i would uh give this to our fan base to decide who, what they think, you know, who they think wins play of the game this week. Um, at this point, I think it's just you and I. So I think between the two of us, we're going to have to pick one, right? That's right. It's a difficult one. And I think even I am breaking the rule of, from a, from a tangible standpoint, because Veronica parrying and keeping me alive is, is tangible, right? It is. I would say... I think Veronica gets it, though, because whereas Troy, who obviously was the hard carry, did it all, stuck with it, at the end of the game, he had a hell of a score and just hella stats to show how awesome he was, and that's victory enough. Whereas Veronica was, was saving you so that you could land the finishing blow. She was supporting you to victory. 
So I think she gets the intangibles play of the game this week. I suppose if you think of it in like a snapshot view where it's like you take the picture of me and the dead boss, Land there's the no shot. Yeah, no recognition for Veronica at all. So She's literally intangible. Her ghost has ascended and <laughs> left the screen. Yes, nothing but her spirit is left. Congrats, Veronica. Play the game. I'll be sure to let her know that she won. <laughs> Tell her a trophy is in the mail. <laughs> it's uh, the slowest shipping method we could find. <laughs> and she has she has to ship it to next week's winner when she gets it. She does need to pay for shipping as well. <laughs> All right. So moving forward, um, this week we're going to be exploring uh, a new segment, something that we haven't done before. Uh, this is our level up segment. So this is an opportunity for us to talk about Something that we're doing in a specific game where we're trying to improve our our gameplay. We're trying to level up our gameplay. Um, so this will. week, yeah, uh, this week I decided to, and I, I've done this a couple times before, but a long time ago, and it's something that's highly recommended in Overwatch and probably lots of other games if you want to get better at the game. Um, but I decided to do some some VOD reviews. I decided to go back to some replays of some close games that I had in the past week and just watch them through, take notes, try to figure out spe- specific things that I could work on to, uh, to improve my game. Um, mm-hmm. So that's exactly what I did. And I took a bunch of notes on it. And if you read my notes, it looks like the scribblings of a madman. Um... <laughs> <laughs> because I was basically just trying to take notes the entire time of little things that I noticed. Uh, and I'm not going to bore everyone. I'm not going to go through all these notes. What I'm going to talk about is kind of one one of the main methods that I, I use. And this is something that I mined from online as far as trying to re- review stuff. Um, and then the major things that I, I took out of it afterwards. So the the one of the, the big ways that I reviewed this was looking at my own deaths. Looking at when I died and trying to evaluate why I died, how I could prevent that in the future, uh, and what aspect of my gameplay kind of tied into how I died. Uh, and there's, it's actually uh, a former Overwatch coach, uh, Jane, you can find him on, on YouTube and on stream. He's back doing the Overwatch stuff now, but he was kind of off for a little while. But way back several years ago, he posted this thing where you make kind of a, you just make a cross, you've got four quadrants, right? And you put, mechanics, positioning, game sense, and good in those four quadrants. And when you look at your good. deaths... Yeah, so exactly. It sounds weird, but I'll get there. Um, so <laughs> basically, the three areas other than good are like when you're assigning what thing you need to improve or what thing was responsible like for... Yeah, what thing was responsible for that death. And if you watch this and you take tallies of this through a bunch of games... Uh, the idea is that you can see, are you all falling into like the mechanics box? Are you falling into you know two of these boxes? Um, so you kind of narrow down what you really need to work on from a gameplay perspective. Um, so I, I use that in looking at my deaths. And the good box is basically if you can't attribute it really to these other three things. You know, Say you're doing your job in a team fight. And the the rest of your team starts to fall off, and now it's a one v four or whatever. Like if you die there, you're supposed to die there. It's going to happen. That's okay if your positioning, your game sense, and your mechanics were good throughout it. You need to be able to recognize when it wasn't your fault. Correct. Yes. And what I can say is there were no good deaths that I would put in the boxes for my gameplay. Um, like sure. when, when it came down to it, I died a lot because of positioning more than anything that's like one of the huge takeaways i took the very first thing i did in the first game i watched um it was a reinhardt on my team i was a support playing baptiste uh so we had ryan zarya i can't remember who the other support was and then we had may uh and mccree i think but reinhardt gets on point and i just jump in with him when i had a perfect angle behind a wall where i could heal him i could heal may i could heal zarya and the enemy team couldn't see me so me jumping into the the fray there is just opening myself up to get picked and not be able to support my team it was just like immediately i was like holy crap what am i doing um and i remember playing this game and thinking this ryan is way too aggressive like you know thinking all the things i could about my my teammates um 
So one of the big takeaways from this, in my opinion, is that like, of course you can blame your teammates all the time, but if you really want to get better at the game, you do have to look at yourself and then the little things that you can do to improve. Um, so, Which is the whole idea of VOD reviews, is to look at your gameplay with a cooler head, detach from the moment so you can make clear evaluations. 100%. And that's why I think ultimately, if you really want to do well with that, I mean, you can ask other people to do VOD reviews for you and they're going to be ruthless. You know, they're not going to sugarcoat it for you. They're not going to give you any benefit like you might for yourself. So um, if you really, you know, throw your ego out the window and ask people to do that, you can definitely see areas to improve. If you're willing to take that hit to your ego. Exactly. And I, I mean, ultimately, I think if you're going to get better at the game, then you kind of have to check that. Or if you're just a, a god naturally, then good for you, I guess. Uh, that's, a, that's a topic for a different time. But it is it is interesting because I think you need both. I think you need to have the confidence and the killer instinct and to think, I am great. So you, may, you go for plays. I think when I'm laning especially in league of legends i suffer from a lack of confidence and i tend to play control mages because i want to sit back and i want to be safe and i lose all the time in trades to people who just have no fear and i'm not saying just play without fear all the time but they have an advantage in situations that i don't because i'm playing back i'm not playing with that you can't touch me attitude so you need that i think but that won't make it so you can improve if you if you never think i'm fallible how are you gonna get better yeah no i mean it makes a ton of sense um i, I think the same thing applies in a lot of other team-based games too you know overwatch is very much the same i've watched a lot of top 500 players play and one of the big things they say is you do have to be aggressive but you also have to know when you can be aggressive and when you can't um so like if you're if you're never taking the fight to the enemy team they're probably going to roll over you eventually. Um, but again, being aware of when you can do that and when you can't is a huge part of the whole thing. So yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with what you said. Um, the three big takeaways that I took from my reviewing of my games were, and I this, this, this is something that I think you disagree with me on, but surviving. Um, you want to be aggressive, like I said, but you, you have to survive. So that very first example I gave of me going in with Reinhardt and Zarya and being on the front line as Baptiste, that's stupid. That just leaves me open for a pick. If I die early, the team has no support, and that's on me. So being cognizant of that and trying to... It, it, it depends on role, too. But like as a support person, as a backliner like I was, I, I needed to take a step back and and make sure that I was prioritizing my life so that I could keep the rest of the team alive as well. You have to affix your own mask before you can help others exactly. put the mask over there. Exactly. Why do you think I would disagree with that? And my team were a bunch of children. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because we, you and I, have, <laughs> you and I have talked about this several times, and I've I've, I've definitely mentioned like trying to survive, to playing to live is is good but only to a point i think that's kind of where the conversation came in because if you if you just play to survive and you're afraid of taking any damage at all and you're not doing anything on the on the battlefield out there then you are useless it's a 5v6 for your team constantly so i think there is a, a line you have to walk um but you i, I think for your average low rank player they die way more often than they should and understanding why you're dying and trying to reduce that can help you a lot. Yeah, there's there's an idea in jumping back to League real quick. There's uh, the three stats you get at the end of the game. The three main stats are KDA, kills, deaths, and assists. And there's a very there's a derogatory term that some people use, which is KDA players. Which is like it's like the gaming equivalent of like bicep curlers who do nothing but like just the just to look good and kda players don't take risks uh they don't die it's like i didn't die i went 2-0 and 5 and my team just did so much worse meanwhile on your team your team got a total of 20 kills and you barely participated just because you didn't want to risk your score risk looking bad or you're just you know afraid to get your hands dirty basically so yeah, I, I do think that 
going deathless is not that's not the goal it can be a sign that you did well but it can be a sign that you weren't playing aggressively enough yep and i i think that that's stats in any of these games can be a really dangerous thing because of that i mean like the overwatch gold medal system is the same way like every every team is going to have somebody with gold damage and gold healing and gold whatever and just because you have the most of something on your team doesn't mean you actually contributed in a meaningful way. So yeah, if, if you just bury your head in the statistics without really looking at how the game works, it yeah, you're probably not going to have the best time. Yep, I agree with that. My second thing, and this is going to sound really stupid because it's just like, a, it's a basic <laughs> thing and I don't think about it when I play so much. Think about your cooldowns. I wrote this down so many times in my notes. Because I would use my L1 as Baptiste, which is your AoE healing, when I was full health and no one else is around me. I would just impulse L1 because I'm in a fight, I'm thinking about it, I'm shooting at people, and I slam L1. It's just a waste. It's an absolute waste of a cooldown that I could use seconds later if somebody dives me or if my teammates are close and they're, they're wounded. So that's something that, again, like when you get into a game... It's so hard to think about all this. You know, you kind of get into an autopilot mode and you're just doing what what you think you need to be doing without really thinking about it. Um, so I, I've been trying to be more conscious of why I'm using my abilities and if that's justified. Two comments. One, one of those that I'm super guilty of in Overwatch is the Lucio boop. I slam that shit on cooldown as soon as it comes off every time. Like, there's just anybody near me, boop, just, I just launch it. Which, part of that is because it has such a low cooldown, but it's still, I think, it's a useful, very useful tool that I just don't apply a lot of critical thinking to. Second, you say you're trying to be more mindful of that. Do you have anything in particular you're doing? To Are you just, like, making a point to look down more at the CD? It's more like, so... Say it's the start of a match. I try to get in the, in the mindset of, so say I'm playing Baptiste. I have Immortality Field. I have AOE Healing. Those are my abilities, you know, other than shooting healing grenades and shooting my gun. Um, I honestly, like, am starting to think about Reload as a cooldown a little bit, too. Um, Baptiste isn't so affected by it, but, like, if you play Anna, for instance, her Reload is super long. And, you know, or if you're the main... Yeah, if, if you're the main healer on your team, or if you're in a, a fight where like you need to be outputting healing and you reload for no reason, you've just wasted two seconds of time that no one is getting healing from you. Or if um, you're Arissa, you wasted 10 seconds of time. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so I try to think of it right at the beginning of the game, like, all right, I'm Baptiste, I have an immortality field, I have AoE healing, I need to use immortality field to counter big plays, especially later in the game, slash keep my main tanks alive. And then I need to use my healing when people actually need healing, <laughs> which again, sounds so stupid, but I'm just, I'm so used to playing him. And it was on a really short cooldown to begin with. Um, they might've extended it since the beginning, but I'm just, I spam the it. In L1? Yeah, I just, I spam it. As soon as it's up, if a fight is going on, all right, here we go. I'm sure our listeners are making fun of us for saying L1 and R1 when we're talking about Overwatch. Yeah. It's funny that we can even remember it, to be honest with you. you usually <laughs> when I try to assign yeah, keys to a, a thought process, it doesn't it doesn't work very well. So that's something that's new. And I, I'd be interested, I don't know, do you have any ideas on how that would be easier or better tracked and thought of throughout a game? Cooldowns? I think this does remind me, again, in League, of an important concept that is very simple but very big which is map awareness so in league you have a mini map at the bottom right hand side and a really important concept in league is the fog of war as in you can't see everything on the map you can only see things that you your teammates and your team's monsters and structures are nearby so it's about moving in this darkness to try to surprise and flank your opponents and new players die very frequently to Fog of War, just not looking at the map, not being aware of where people are. And a big skill to learn early on, even now, is to be aware of the map. And really, like a huge part of that is just 
getting in the habit training your brain of flicking your eyes constantly at that mini map any down second you have just checking the map just for a second and so i think there could be a similar thing with overwatch trying to get better at the cooldowns just constantly anytime there's a half beat where you're not in immediate danger glance down at your cooldowns even if you already feel good about where your cooldowns are just you're constantly reinforcing that habit and getting a better better feel for when your stuff is up and you're thinking about it. you're making it present in your mind when are my abilities available to me what can i do with them sure you're forming that habit then too and you're just gonna eventually subconsciously do that you know just glancing up and down and knowing what you're doing i'll have to try that i think too i think too um this is something people do just because what else are you gonna do but in the spawn before the game starts throw your abilities look at the timer just get it in your head yeah i i i wonder how much of a difference that'll make and i bet it's important for specific duration abilities more than anything like i'm thinking of immortality field in my head right now which is a like 25 plus second cooldown it's one of the longest in the game um that one you pretty much know you know once you've thrown it it's like all right I'm not going to have it again until the next team fight. Like this, this is just gone. Um, but things that are on like a three or four or five second cooldown, where it could be in the middle of a team fight, and really make an impact. Um, I could see that being being very important. Like a sleep dart, like huge game changing ability in a team fight, or the grenade. Like those are the ones I think are the most crucial. Where they're in that in between ground. Like Lucio Boop, I need to be better at it, but I don't get punished that hard for throwing it because in three more seconds, I'll have another one. Whereas you throw the grenade and you miss it, and now you're looking at 12 seconds. Now it's long enough that you can be punished, but it's not so long that you're like, ah, that's gone. Don't have to think about it. Hmm, interesting. Um, The last thing that I wrote down as my major takeaway was focus fire. Um, And again, this is from Baptiste's perspective in the games that I watched, but... uh, we as a team did really well when i was able to contribute damage to the same targets that you know say my tanks were working on or whoever i'm kind of near and and focused with whoever they're they're fighting against if they're in decent health if i can get you know a little extra damage in there that makes as much difference if not more than trying to heal my teammates um and i think that's that's Baptiste's utility, really, when it comes down to it. He's a hit scan DPS. He can put out a ton of damage. Uh, he's got the Amp Matrix as his ultimate, so he can even amplify his damage and his team's damage. Um, so being aware of that, being aware you're not there just to heal and helping your teammates secure kills, that was what really won us fights and got us to flip the points. So again, trying to be more aware of it kind of ties into cooldowns. Trying to be more aware of the situation and and realizing, okay, my teammate is healthy enough here and I can help them get this kill rather than just trying to juice them up and not help them do any damage. And that could go on for who knows how long or the, the opponent could get away or, you know, whatever. I think this ties into something too that I'll probably mention in a future episode as far as my own level up advice. And I know you and I have talked about this before, which is, it's better to make bad plays together than good plays alone by yourself most of the time. Um, and there's so many times where you might be looking at your teammates and thinking, my teammates aren't prioritizing the right targets. But guess what? It's better that you you can control your actions. So if you join your teammates in trying to kill this other target that you don't think is the best choice and you take them down, that's better than you trying to kill the Bastion by yourself when you're unable to. That's going to be more effective. 100%. Yeah, I mean, we always joke about that with the uh, the Reinhardt on your team who just charges in. Yeah, that that's not necessarily a good strategy, but if you all go in there with him and you try to keep him up and you take the fight in, maybe you'll win it. And, you know, it, it's, it's better to all try to dive in there than to let him die and then be out and be in a 5v6 every fight. Yep, for sure. So that that was Dang. my two uh, my two VOD reviews I did. Uh, I really do think I'm going to try to do them a little more frequently. Um, you and I have been playing a little bit more in ranked and trying to climb. 
Uh, we've been having some good win streaks recently, knock on wood. Yeah, um, for real. So I'm I'm hoping to apply this, keep reviewing, keep improving, and circle back to this eventually and, and keep talking about it. I'm impressed. I've never done a, a serious VOD review. It's, My VOD reviews tend to be extremely masturbatory. <laughs> it's uh, even just getting used to using the replay system, especially with a PlayStation controller, is a pain in the butt. Like, you can go from from character point of view to character point of view, and that's easy. But actually using the map overhead and like looking at how fights draw out and how things go, there's kind of an art to it. It, it gives me a newfound respect for whoever runs the, the camera cameras. work in Overwatch League yeah. whenever you're watching. All right, and that brings us to the main segment, The Breakdown. Oh, let's break it down! Why are you so angry? And that brings us to The Breakdown. So this week for The Breakdown, uh, I wanted to talk about Sonic Mania. I want to talk about Sonic Mania, and I want to talk a little bit about Sonic in general first, uh, because there was a specific scenario that led me to Sonic Mania, uh, and that I immediately messaged you about Sonic Mania after I downloaded it and played for a little bit, because I was just so enamored with it. So I was at a friend's house. Um, our friends Scott and Kelsey have a, a baby recently, and we were helping them take care of the baby. By which I mean Scott and I were drinking whiskey in the basement and we ended up playing uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on his Wii. So he had downloaded this years ago on his Wii. Um, it was an application that was available for cheap, threw it on there, and he had mentioned it earlier in the weekend. And you and I played Sonic 3 as well as other Sonic games a ton. So I was like, yes, let's play, let's do it. And the first night that we played in the basement, I literally, like, I didn't give the controller to Scott basically at all. He was just watching <laughs> me speed run this. Um, and I, like, just played through the first three-fourths of Sonic the Hedgehog 3 with him sitting next to me chatting. And it was just so incredible. That game was amazing when we were younger and we played it. I have nothing but fond memories. And going back to it was just, it was amazing. It was so, so much fun. Um, it definitely wasn't as challenging as uh, the first time we played it by any means, but it was still a blast. I still you know, ended up dying and we had to call it quits after one night. I did beat the game after two nights of playing. I'm sure uh, uh, it had to feel good to be playing this and have your friend like sort of jaw open being like, what is happening right now? <laughs> it, it was pretty funny. Yeah, he... I, he's played it some, but not a whole lot, I don't think. And so, yeah, to just watch me... I, I literally, I, I felt like I was speedrunning it, especially in the first few levels. Um, you know, you start at Angel Island, and just every little bit of that was so familiar. I remembered everything that happened through the whole thing. Um, it was awesome. And that just led me immediately to try to look for ports of Sonic games that I could play on my own systems. Uh, so I, I looked on the Switch initially. That's the system that I had with me at the time. And there are some ports of other older Sonic games. We bought the original Sonic the Hedgehog port on the Switch. Uh, the aspect ratio is a little funky because it's from Sega Genesis. You know, it's a 4-3. That's what it is. Uh, and that was fun for a little bit. But I kept reading and kept looking. And so Sonic Mania came out in 2017. It's been out for some years now. And I was reading a bunch of reviews and... Almost everyone had good things to say about it. Both people who had played previous Sonic games and loved them, and people who had never played a Sonic game. So I downloaded it on PlayStation when I got home, and I started to play it. And that is when I messaged you and told you about it, because I just I fell in love with the game. I played the first three or four zones the first day I had it. Um, and I, I played for a while. Like they were, they were challenging zones when it came down to it, which is part of what hooked me into it. Um, so I want to go through and just talk about some of the different things that make the game so good, uh, that, that make it so enjoyable to me and kind of a little, some, some just little tidbits about it that are, are interesting. So the game itself was actually made, uh, in commemoration of the original Sonic game. It's it's basically a 25th anniversary celebration of Sonic the Hedgehog. And 
The whole thing is a passion project for um, Christian Whitehead, who you're familiar with. He is an Australian developer, uh, game developer, who he's just a huge Sonic fan. He's been involved in kind of the Sonic. Clearly. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's, been, he's been involved, heavily involved in the Sonic fan base for a long time. And back in 2011, he developed a port of the very first Sonic game that you and I ever played, which was Sonic CD. Uh, this was a, a disc that came with our Windows 95 computer. It was like the first video game, like real video game that we ever played, as far as I know. Well, to, to correct a tiny little bit, I remember, because we were not allowed to have video games, by and large, at our house. It was kind of like our the... It was kind of like uh, the Waterboy's mom. She, she would call video games the devil, right? I don't ever want you associating with video games. Why not, mama? Because video games are the devil. Yes, that that is very much what it would be like. But I do like video games, and I do like Vicky Valancourt's movies. <laughs> um, but no, we would go um, every once in a while, and mom and dad would would visit their college friends, David and Robin, and uh, David is a huge video game fan. I don't know if he still is, but he definitely was. And uh, he had all the new systems as they came out. And we would go over there, and it was just a time for hedonistic pleasure of playing video games. <laughs> and one of the first times we went over and they had games, we played the the Sega Genesis, and we played original Sonic. Oh, uh, that's right. I remember falling in love with it. I remember to this day coming home and making a drawing of a Sonic level. Uh, with crayon and then when we got the windows 95 it came bundled with that disc and so we got a little taste of sonic when we were over at dave and robbins and then we all of a sudden have a fully fledged sonic game and i would argue i know i'm completely biased and i know this is nostalgia but sonic cd is just a strictly superior sonic game to the original I, I would I'm just, I would agree. Put it out there. I would agree with that. So the original Sonic is great. I, I feel like it has some of the same I don't even want to call it issues, but some of the same critiques that like Super Mar Mario Brothers original has where the physics of the gameplay don't feel as good as basically all of the future Sonics, frankly. Um yes. so Sonic C D definitely felt more fluid. It felt more Yeah, it, I, I think that there was a better feel with the game and then the levels themselves were just so cool in sonic cd i love the levels in okay. sonic cd um they're fantastic yeah, yeah. you can't beat them and that it also has this bizarre mechanic of time travel where you can go to the past or future of the level so if you go to the past it's like idyllic before robotnik got there you go to the future and it's a hellscape where he rules everything like fucking aku and samurai jack and and you can affect the future which was so cool you can go destroy yeah. these machines that are destroying the place apparently and if you go to the future after doing that it's a beautiful it's like you know it's it's the perfect future it's a perfect point. future yeah. yeah it's it's incredible i love that it was so such a strange thing to throw in there but it's so cool i really enjoy it so yeah, Sonic CD, he made a port of that um, back in 2011. That's something that I have played on my cell phone, uh, which I, I remember looking for Sonic CD, like looking for some way to play it for years and not finding anything. Um, and we weren't able to play it on the, the computer at home anymore. It was just unfindable. It was gone forever. So being able to download that on my phone and just play through it wasn't the same by any means. The controls are wonky yeah. on a touchscreen, but it was still just so. It was great to reconnect to that. It was. I remember doing that, and I don't know if you had this thought when you played it on your phone for the first time of being like, "Imagine showing my childhood self doing this, like on this tiny little device that po I can take anywhere." Pocket video games? Are you kidding me? Yeah. The biggest problem I had with the the ported version, I, I the controls. Yeah, I mean, what are you gonna do? It's on a phone. The music. It was not the original music on the phone. And the original music on Sonic CD is some of the best video game music on the entire planet. Because it was like real digital music. It was not, it was not, oh, I, I can't, you gotta go and find that. Listener, go listen to the original Sonic CD soundtrack. That is some, there's guitar riffs, saxophone, like 
It's amazing. It's incredible. And Sonic Mania absolutely does it justice. They have a ton of new music that feels just so much like that Sonic CD. I I would argue, well, I'd have to go back and listen to, I guess, the original Sonic. I don't know that that music was as good. But Sonic CD rocks, and then this Sonic Mania rocks. I think Sonic Sonic 3 was decent, too. Um, Oh, yeah, it was. And I, actually, I know that Sonic 2, for instance, had some bangers in it because um, Never Ending Solo, who is a, a group who <laughs> is has transcribed the Sonic digital music into real instrumental music, um, they did Chemical Plant Zone. And that's from Sonic 2, which I've never played. And... I, so there's a chemical plant zone in Sonic Mania that has some of the same music, and it's it's amazing. It's just it, it the the never ending solo version is awesome. The Sonic Mania version is awesome. I have to assume the original version is since it's all based on that is also awesome. Um, they actually made a vinyl of the Sonic Mania soundtrack that. I was looking around, and you can buy it from, like, small shops and stuff here and there. It's not really mass available at this point. So if you're a super fan, you can go find it online and buy it from a reseller and play it on your, your record player at home and enjoy it, you know, that that un... That, that's, that, that's a niche interest right there. Absolutely. It's a cool kind of transparent blue vinyl disc, too. Like, I, I, I'm thinking about it. So it looks like it. Sonic spinning around? Absolutely. It probably does. Wow. Come on. I thought it was really cool. I was excited about it. So he did that port. He yeah, actually he, be. he actually did a, an original Sonic and a Sonic 2 port that were released in 2013. Uh, he worked on Sonic 3, but that never got released. And eventually this has kind of led into the Sonic Mania 25th anniversary thing. So he, he and Sega combined to make a commemoration of Sonic's history and just make an awesome game that brings you back to the originals and adds some new stuff in. And I, I think they absolutely delivered on it. Um, I, I like, I loved every minute of it. There are thirteen. If you go ahead. If if you are a Sonic fan, and we were big Sonic fans, if you go and play this, it's like remixes of previous zones from previous games that incorporate elements from games that it wasn't a part of it, but feel completely natural in it and wholly new levels. And I see your note here and I completely agree that feel like somehow they're like lost levels from the past that, that did get published, but like they're just, they fit so naturally and perfectly into these games. Yeah, they, they feel instantly like classic zones that you've played before. It's kind of crazy. Um, this is the most extensive Sonic game as far as zones go. There are 13 zones in this Sonic game. Um, I can't think of what the next closest is, but 13. Eight of those are remastered, so based on original zones from other Sonic games. And the way they did the remastering I thought was pretty cool. The they were, They're all two acts in each zone, and the first act is much more similar to the original that they're playing from um but still adds a little bit of extra stuff to it remix and then as soon as you get into the second act it's it's the same textures and colors and all that but it's entirely new so they give you this like one act to kind of get used to it have some familiarity and then they throw you into a whole new act with the same stuff going on so you get to learn a whole new thing uh and i love that I, i i think it was perfect again it's a good combination of the base material and what they're coming from and then giving you this new twist and new experience that you can you can enjoy uh there, there's new levels like you said five new ones and they just their their music is fantastic as well the music fits right in with all the other music in, in the game they've got cool little just features in in each level that just i, I was looking at the details and i loved it uh press garden is a brand new level and they've got these They've got these little ink pots. So Press Garden is supposed to be almost like a newspaper printing garden place. It makes no fucking sense, but that doesn't matter. You've you've got the idea of Press Garden, right? There's newspapers on reels just rolling around in the background. There's little ink blotters and, and little enemy ink guys popping out of them. So they keep all that theming there 
in a brand new level. And it, it just, I don't know, it all kind of comes together. It just feels so natural and good. I like, here's a comparison. Sonic the Hedgehog is like a death trap dungeon where things making sense isn't the goal. What matters is the theme. Is the theming consistent? You don't have to, because I remember like everybody's made the joke of like, why does Dr. Robotnik keep the power-ups on the level for Sonic to get? It's like, because it's fun. That's the point. <laughs> and the, the theming is very similar, where it's like, it's not here to make like a, we're not world building here, you know? It's just a cool theme to explore. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of Sonic CD and like Carnival Night, I guess. Oh, no, that's that's Sonic 3, but we'll go there anyway. Sonic 3, Carnival Night. The theme is literally just like circus shit. I was just, the entire thing is just colorful. You've got the stripy poles and stuff. You've got balloons popping everywhere. You've just got shining lights and stuff. It 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 doesn't make sense in the world, like you said. What we're at some carnival that Doctor Robotnik created or something. I I don't know. But when you're going through the whole thing, the enemies kind of make sense with that theme. The way you get from point A to point B makes sense with the theme. It all just it ties in together and feels good. Or start a speedway from Sonic CD. It's like a Las Vegas, like, running race world. Yeah. It doesn't make, and there are lightning bugs that connect laser beams between them. <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense. It's just awesome. <laughs> so one of the things about this game that is different, I guess I would say, the the boss battles that you go through at the end of each of these acts there there's some that are directly taken from past games but there's a lot that are based on these new characters called um they're called something heavies i, I was looking at this uh the other day because i don't know sonic lore and i apologize to anybody who cares about sonic lore i, I honestly i really don't care about I, sonic lore too much yeah. um and yeah, i don't apologize at the very beginning of this game what happens is, so, so I'll give you a tiny bit of lore. The end of Sonic <laughs> 3 and Knuckles is where Sonic Mania starts, basically. So Sonic and Tails are flying away from the end of Sonic 3, and some sort of disturbance happens. They go to investigate it. It's back on uh, Green Hill Zone. So we're going to a whole different, we're going to the original uh, you know, Green Zone, all these other games have made kind of duplicates of it with different names, Angel Island, whatever. We're going all the way back to the original. And when you get there, there's a bunch of these heavies, whatever they're called, who are mining for some other type of stone. So not a Chaos Emerald, but something else. It's, it's kind of the same stuff. But these guys get together, they dig it out. Some big, strange, t warping thing happens, and that's what transports you and Tails uh, to the beginning of the actual game where you got to chase everything down. So these heavies that we're talking about are the bosses at the end of most of these zones, these acts. And they're so varied and weird from what I'm used to with Sonic. But I really, really enjoyed them because of that, I think. Like, I, I died a lot. I actually had to, you know, restart from the beginning of, of some of these zones because I couldn't get past the bosses the first time. And I really enjoyed that challenge. I haven't felt that challenge with a Sonic game in, I don't know how long. I mean, it's been years and years and years. Not since uh, Carnival Night having to get past the uh, <laughs> up and down barrel. Yeah, that could be a whole episode by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing about the game that i wasn't a huge fan of and i don't i guess I'm, I'm really not a fan of it now that i know that there is some extra that comes comes with this but the ring bonuses um Ugh. yeah they're 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 very very punishing when it comes down to it. so there's there's two types of bonuses I'll call them in the game. If you hit a check post, you get the little stars that go over your check post uh, if you have enough rings similar to Sonic 3. But if you jump through them, you don't get the gumball machine thing. What you get is Which the... sucks. Hey, you could get a shield out of it, though. Like, that was a cheap way to get a shield, in my opinion. That, that thing was fine, right? That, that's why I liked it. Yeah. I, I'm saying I'm saying what they replaced it with sucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because what they replaced it with is... And I stopped doing them because of this. So you jump them and you get put into the blue sphere ring bonuses, which were the Sonic 3 and Knuckles actual ring bonuses that would give you Chaos Emeralds. 
So it puts you in these, and if you win them, you get a medallion. And there's, I think there's infinite variations of these blue sphere uh, levels because you can get they're like procedurally generated. I think I think after a point they are because there's clearly some that are definitely from the original game, and then there's a bunch that are not. Uh, and I think on the Sonic Three and Knuckles game, there was a strictly blue sphere version of the game you could play. Uh, our sisters, Samantha and April, that was their primary way of playing Sonic the Hedgehog. They just played the Blue Sphere Zones. Right, and if I recall correctly, there were more than the number of them in the game in that. Many, 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 many more. So it very well could just be a, a had, random selection from that group that it throws at you. I don't know. They gave you, if you played just the Blue Sphere Zone, after you beat one, you got, a, I don't know, like a six-digit or six-character code. And the girls had a little journal, and they would just write the code down. And they, it was like if you open it up, it would look like an insane person's like you mentioning conspiracy. It's just like that journal. Like literally, I hadn't thought about that at all. That that brings back like instantaneously. I can I'm in the den looking at that notebook of numbers. Yep, yep. It's like something from fucking Lost. <laughs> and the smoke monster's on his way. Um, yeah. But yeah, so they don't really get you anything. They get you these medallions, and the medallions unlock features within the game that are just wholly unnecessary to play. Uh, they, they give you the ability to just make kind of changes in, make changes in how Sonic works a little bit. So you, you can change him from from essentially the original Sonic version, the Sonic 3 version, uh, or I think maybe the Sonic CD version, where you've got like the double attack or you've got the uh, hyper sp speed thing that he does in Sonic CD. It, it doesn't really make a difference, in my opinion, as far as how you would play the game. Um, if you want to get super... I guess that's cool. It's, it is. It's a cool, it's a feature, but I don't really care about it. And I stopped playing those bonuses because... It's, it just takes time that I would rather be playing the actual Sonic game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just makes me sad because I the only... That is, like, my only critique of the game so far is those ring bonuses and bonus levels, you used to get so excited to get them, and now I feel nothing when I get to them. Because then you, you turn to the actual ring bonuses, which are these big 3D rings you jump through, which is, it's awesome. I, the first time I got one, I was like, all right, here we go. And then it's this kind of funky version of the 3D UFO chase down ring bonuses, which that came from Sonic CD as well. Which was dope. Which was actually pretty cool. And we figured out how to play those pretty well when it came down to it. Um, and maybe that'll be the case for these eventually. I don't know. I've tried to. I've played this game through twice, and I've got two other saves going. I'm not any better at it right now. I can assure you that. And what happens is <laughs> you're limited in your track. You've got borders on either side that you can't go through. So you have to follow this UFO. And as soon as you get off track and start to get slowed down, that UFO makes a bunch of distance between you and it. And you can get these spheres to up your speed. But I've, I've done this on several where I have gotten to Mach 3 after getting as many rings to push the time out as I can and getting as many spheres as I can to catch up. And I'm still nowhere close to the UFO if I bounce off the side and ended up in the grass and all this stuff. So it's like you have to be perfect in order to get the Chaos Emeralds or whatever they're called in this case. And I, I yeah, I've got maximum of three on any playthrough so far. Three out of seven less than half so uh and my my big beef with that is that i learned that there's actually a secret ending where if you get all those emeralds before you fight the last boss you actually go to another boss battle in kind of like a different dimension is basically what happens you get pulled in with dr robotnik by another bad guy and you have another bat boss battle to fight so that's a little disappointing. I'm I don't know if I'll ever get there just because of time when it comes down to it. Like you sure. have to put in a shitload of time to get all of those emeralds and do that one little fight. Um, so that's that's my one my one beef. Yeah, I I mean again, it's cool. Like this is a game for the fans, and you can just play it and have an awesome time. But for like the ultra hardcore fans, what a cool Easter egg! Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. The last thing that I have 
to chat about Sonic Mania um, are a few bugs that I was reading about that were just kind of funny to me. I haven't experienced them. I think that they've... They, they, it depends on what platform you play it on because this is available on PC, this is available on Switch, uh, it's available on PS4. It might be available on Xbox even? It probably is. I don't know why it wouldn't be. Yeah, PlayStation 4, Switch, yeah. Xbox One, Windows. You can get it on any of those. So this could be specific to platforms. I haven't run into any of it, but there's a few bugs that I just found hilarious. And there was the list that I looked at, looked at for bugs was very large. So... Um, <laughs> I, a lot of I mean when you got one guy doing all the heavy lifting I guess it's gonna happen yeah. I think it was him and one other person who were doing a lot of this uh, and they did have support Still. support from Sega thankfully on this one obviously because this I mean again this is the longest literally the longest Sonic game in existence as far as these platformers go so God, these dudes must just live and breathe Sonic the Hedgehog he absolutely must um, it was really satisfying for me to download a brand new game on PlayStation that was in the megabytes and downloaded in like a second and was just ready to play. Uh, I'm so used to, yeah, yeah I'm, so, I'm used to downloading, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of yeah, games. I'm used to doing a patch on my game and it's like, well, I guess I'll walk away from this for a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was nice to get back into the old style graphics. All right, here are the bugs that I have written down because I thought they were okay. funny. Uh, the first one is known as the Pity Emerald. For unknown circumstances in a special stage, the UFO can abruptly turn around and fly towards the player, immediately rewarding them with a Chaos Emerald. Hasn't happened with me. This is a bug that this is a bug that I need in my exactly. life. I would like this every time. Ten out of ten times, I would want this bug. That would be great. Uh, I haven't encountered it, but I hope I hope I do. <laughs> uh, the next one is called Tails Just Chillin'. So, when playing as Sonic and Tails in the final boss fight, if Tails gets grabbed by both hands... So, this is literally the final boss fight before the secret boss. If Tails gets grabbed by both hands from the boss, the boss gets locked into this, and you can't do damage to the boss, and the boss can't damage you. So, you literally just have to wait until time's out, and you die in order to try again. I just want to say, if you're playing by yourself... Do not play with Tails. Tails is just the biggest piece of shit. He's a huge liability. Honestly, if you're playing with a friend, don't play with Tails. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true, Just too. swap controller, I, you know, I take was, turns and, and call it good. I was playing with Amber, and we were playing with Tails, and it was cool in some circumstances, but I am convinced... We encountered a few different times... This bug isn't on your list. I don't even know if you would call it a bug, but there are a few different points in the game where we just got permanently stuck somewhere... So we fell into a, a pit, like a little pit area that you could run around in, and there was no way to get out of it. And I think it was because we used the fire shield, which burnt a bridge that we were supposed to be able to hit a spring and jump back up to. But because we burnt it, there was nothing to jump on. So we just had to quit and start over. So it's not perfectly polished. No, definitely not. There are definitely some things that did not get play tested fully. <laughs> I'll have to look and see if that is a bug that exists, because um, I would be very curious. There's a. I'll send you the full list at some point so you can see. It's uh, it's pretty. It's a, it's a lot longer than I expected it to be. Yeah. What's your last bug? My last bug is called Giant Character. So it's it's a glitch that can only be done in Encore mode, which is the um, that's the DLC for the game. They made a, a DLC that's like four or five bucks. It happens suddenly. Uh, it it mainly involves switching the player's character while they're jumping back on the screen. So in this Encore mode, you can play. You 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 can get as Sonic these little companions who kind of follow you around. And you can switch between them and use new abilities that they have. Um, but if you do this, and, and this bug happens, when you switch to the, the character while they're jumping back on screen, it causes them to be giant, just enormous on screen. And they stay that way the rest of the level. So if you get this bug, you all of a sudden become giant Sonic or whoever, and you just you literally have to run through the rest of the level as a giant Sonic. Can you do it? Yeah, you absolutely can. You're, you're, it's just showing like your model that big, I think. It's not like actually you being that big. So it's it's kind of fucked up gotcha. when you try to play. But yeah, absolutely you can. But you, but you can physically do it. That's interesting. 
So again, I have not Very encountered cool. any of these uh, bugs. These are, well, realistically, I don't think I would want the second one, but I did think it was hilarious. The first and the third, I would, I, I, I would enjoy playing, no doubt. The first one is a feature. Give me that pity emerald. Yeah. Fuck chasing these UFOs. <laughs> yeah. It, I was going to say, I guess, you know. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I do agree with you. It is it is sad that those those ring bonuses are just so meaningless to me right now. I, even when I find a new big ring bonus, which they're pretty hard to find, frankly. Um, I, I'm not. I, I just know if it's outside of the first three, I'm probably not going to get it right now. And that's frustrating. Yeah, I mean, it's a reward for the truly hardcore among us, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that's the intent, right? You know, and yeah, these are people who have been fans of the game and every game for a long time. So, I think a good note to leave on, you know, there are these extra things for super hardcore people who want to sink hundreds of hours into these games, and there are things for people who just remember playing sonic and enjoying it if you ever liked playing sonic it, it doesn't matter what to what extent you played it you will get some joy out of playing this game and it's definitely worth picking up i agree i couldn't agree more i it was well worth the 1999 that i paid for it uh i will absolutely play it again and yeah i just want to go listen to the soundtrack i want to get back into chemical plant zone and just hear it riff out man it's so good all right well i think that does it for the show kenny do you have anything you'd like to add no i have nothing i would like to add i think it's perfect as is and i think if it goes on another 10 seconds it'll be ruined put a bow on it i'm matt i'm kenny we're the intangibles <laughs>